Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... story to tell you about trickery and venality and genius and the threat of an alien presence in our midst. A story, too, that may leave you wondering about procedures behind secret doors where, although it is your future that is being rewritten, you are not invited to participate. Listen closely. It could happen. You were going to tell me something about what this Professor Addison is up to? Yes. We have reason to believe that he is working on a method, uh, a mathematical concept, I should say. Yes. Which may very well achieve the time bypass necessary for interstellar travel. Wait, wait. I, I didn't quite get that. It's completely beyond either of us, so don't expect me to explain it to you. He's working on a way to travel between galaxies. You... You take it seriously? I mean, you believe it's possible? It's already been done, my friend. Where do you think the unidentified flying objects come from? Our mystery drama, The Eavesdroppers, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington and stars Arnold Moss. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There is an old house in Pennsylvania's beautiful Pocono Mountains, which has recently and at considerable expense been restored to its original condition. One wing has been made ideally suitable for use as a laboratory. This work was all arranged for and supervised by a man who calls himself Mr. Smith. More, one suspects, to promote anonymity than to establish identity. The job is finished now, and Mr. Smith is interviewing two people, Pearl and Edgar Parker to whom he has offered a rather uh, peculiar job. Frankly, Mr. Smith, I don't like it. I'm an electronics engineer. I wouldn't enjoy working as a handyman. And my wife isn't a housemaid either. No, I'm not. And the other part of the job, the part you haven't told us much about, I think I like that even less. To begin with, I happen to know that you're out of a job and have been for some time. You need money. All right, all right. That may be true. But undercover agents, isn't that what you want us to be? If you like a spade, call a spade, yes. Why us? We don't know anything about espionage. But you know a great deal about electronic equipment, and that's what's needed. That and two people to look after a big house. Well, all right, all right. Suppose you give us some details. First of all, if we decide to take this thing, how much? At the end of the summer, you'll receive $20,000 in cash. Oh, that's, um, that, that, that's different, isn't it, Edgar? Well, it depends on what we have to do for it. To whom and for whom. I want to know who and what, Mr. Smith. You'll be working for... for aliens. Beings from another planet. From another galaxy, actually. Oh, come on. You wanted the truth, you have it. Oh, there aren't any such people. Oh, but there are. I've been in touch with them for some time. Our environment doesn't suit them. They come to Earth only in cases of extreme emergency. I... I don't believe you. It doesn't matter what you believe. 
The 20,000 will be good, solid American dollars. Now, look, whatever they want or don't want, it's clear that we'll be operating against somebody, and I'd like to know who. A single scientist who's working on a project my clients don't want to succeed. It would be against their best interests. All right, what's his name? We hope to rent the house to a Professor Dwight Addison... You may have heard the name. He's a very highly rated physicist. One of the top few. A physicist? Oh, if it's going to be bombs. No bombs. He's into something entirely different. All right, I've heard of Dwight Addison. What would you expect us to do, Mr. Smith? Edgar, if it isn't bombs and uh, it's uh, 20,000... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you want us to do, Mr. Smith? <laughs> Jane. I've cleaned out my desk, kissed my equipment goodbye, put my reactors to bed for their long summer hibernation. Professor Dwight Addison is on sabbatical. The summer is my personal property. <laughs> we still have to look for a house, you know. Well, whoever heard of ointment without a fly in it? A house where the owners won't object to your converting a basement or a garage or something into a laboratory. Mm -hmm. We'll look into Mars Times. Maybe we'll be lucky. Well, that's an excellent idea. Jane, I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> well, time to make the phone call, I guess. To the uh, to them? Uh, that's right. The aliens themselves, Edgar? No, no. Smith said he'd be our control. Oh, where is he? Uh, where do you have to call? Some place in New York. That's all I know. I wouldn't know that even, except for the area code. All the same, even if it's not them... It makes me feel creepy. $20,000. That's the thing to keep in mind, Pearl. The money. Okay, here goes. I always wanted to go to Europe. Could we go afterwards or maybe take a cruise somewhere? Mm. You... Yes? Uh, this is... No names. No names ever. Has it carried out your instructions? To the letter. Everything as ordered. Very well. Now, let me hear your story again. Well, we've been through it a lot, Mr. Smith, and Once I really know more, it... please. All right. The owner of the house is James Ellis. He's in Wall Street. He and his wife are taking the summer off and touring Europe. He's an amateur scientist. That's why he's got the lab set up. Pearl and I have worked for them for years and are almost like family. I assist him in the lab sometimes, and, uh, um, let me see, um... Your privacy. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's uh, been a rule for years that nobody ever comes into our wing of the house. That's like part of our pay. We have complete privacy. Don't forget it. All right. We'll put the ad in tomorrow morning's times. You should hear from the tenant sometime tomorrow. Try to make an appointment to show him the house for tomorrow afternoon. We're in a hurry. Well, what if somebody else sees the ad and calls first? No one else will see the advertisement. It will be placed only in the tenant's copy of the Times. Well, how can you do that? Just do as you're told. Don't worry about things that don't concern you. I don't like that man. $20,000, Edgar. It's going to be a strain at any price. Dwight? Hmm? Dwight, I found it. It's here. It sounds absolutely perfect. Oh, that's wonderful. Sugar Heights, Pennsylvania, heart of the Poconos. Twelve-room Victorian home, recently restored, all in excellent condition. Housekeeper and chauffeur groundskeeper included or no deal. West wing occupied by help. East wing suitable for use as workshop, studio, or laboratory. What? Immediate occupancy for season only. Season ending on September 30th. <laughs> sort of big for us, but otherwise, doesn't it sound perfect, Dwight? Yes, yes, it does. Almost too perfect, don't you think? Oh, how can a thing be too perfect? Well, my work is classified, Jane, most secret. I don't know, it almost sounds as though someone knew I wanted a place to work this summer and has made this one to order for me. Oh, no, really, Dwight. Well, that's a trouble, you know, with doing this sort of work. It makes you suspicious. All right, we we won't worry about it. Shall we call and make an appointment to see the house? Well, there's no harm in looking. Maybe the roof leaks or something. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, the way the ad reads, it just sounds... Too good to be true. Uh, 
Hello? I'm calling about your ad in the Times this morning. Has the house been taken yet? Uh, no, not yet. My husband and I would like to drive out and look at it. Uh, may I have the name, please? Uh, Professor and Mrs. Dwight Addison. We live in New York City and we're looking for a summer house. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Edgar Parker. My wife and I look after the place. I, I think the ad said something about that. Oh, yes, that part's fine. When may we see the house? Any time, Mrs. Addison. This afternoon would be fine. This afternoon, say around two? Very good, and I, I'm sure you'll like the place, Mrs. Addison. Yes, my husband says it sounds made to order. <laughs> Well, that's uh, just about everything, Mrs. Addison. You do like the place, don't you, Dwight? Oh, yes, yes, very much indeed. You're sure now that the owners won't mind my moving my own equipment into the lab? Oh, no, Mr. Ellis will be glad to have it used. As I told you, he's a kind of amateur at science himself. <laughs> Dabbling, he calls it. As a matter of fact, I help him out sometimes, kind of like a lab assistant, you know. Yes, I see. If uh, if you wanted me to, I could help you out around the lab, too. You know, just wash up and keep everything straight, things like that. I always enjoy doing it for Mr. Ellis. Uh, no, thank you. That won't be necessary. It wouldn't be any trouble at all. Professor Addison never uses an assistant. He likes to work alone. Oh, well, well then... Shall we take it, right? I think it's just lovely. Yes, it's very suitable. All right, we'll take it. Do you have to report every night, Edgar? Yes, that's Smith's main reason for giving us a private wing in the house, so we can have our own telephone. Yes? Uh, they took the place. I guess you already know that. He doesn't use an assistant, though, so I can't right. possibly... You'll have to get into the lab on your own. They're planning to move in tomorrow, I believe? Tomorrow afternoon. All right, you stay there with them through dinner, then drive to Allentown, to Benny's Bar and Grill. I'll meet you there at 9.30 tomorrow evening. Look, if you just tell me now what now, I should look for... don't be a fool. This is a telephone we're talking on. I'll see you tomorrow, 9.30 p.m. <laughs> You have to admit that Pearl and Edgar were a big help. And the dinner was good, didn't you think? Well, I, I suppose it would be presumptuous to criticize him. Presumptuous to criticize Edgar? Edgar? Oh, no, no, no. Einstein. I didn't know we were talking about him. No, he might very well have decided not to go on. Except he didn't hold back on the other equation. If you're going to wander away, dear, try not to get lost. It's a strange house, you know? Well, was Mr. Big Shot Smith satisfied, Edgar? Oh, he wouldn't say so if he was. I have to meet him in Allentown tomorrow night. Oh, no. And leave me here alone? Well, that's what the man says. The bugs must be working. He seemed to know all about everything that's been going on in the house. Well, they ought to work, the time you spend on them. For $20,000, I do very good work, Pearl. You, uh... Still don't believe about the aliens and all that, do you? To tell the truth, I don't care very much. Mm, the way he told it, though, it, it really sounded like... Shh, 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 be quiet. Oh, um, gee, you startled me. Uh, Professor Addison, please, this is our wing of the house. It's supposed to be private. Oh, I am sorry. I, my wife says I'm just a little absent-minded at times. I get preoccupied and... Oh. Well, I suppose I didn't pay much attention to where I was going. I do apologize. Oh, well, that's, uh... That's all right, Professor. I assure you, it won't happen again. Okay, okay, that's okay. Do you think he heard what we were saying? I doubt it. He's in a real fog most of the time. Jane, we're going into the city tomorrow. Into the city? What on earth for? We just got here. Well, I have some errands to do that can't wait. What errands? <laughs> well, okay, you go if you have to. Well, I think I'll stay here. There are still a few little things I want to rearrange. Jane, I want you to come with me tomorrow. Please do as I say. Why, Dwight? And don't argue with me. <laughs> well, of course, if you feel that strongly about I it. I do. I'm going into the lab now. I'll probably be working most of the night, so don't wait up for me. Are there actually...
actually creatures from another galaxy capable of exerting an influence on the people of our Earth? We have only a Mr. Smith's word for it. And if he has chosen to use an assumed name, as we suspect, then perhaps this more fantastic statement of his is also suspect. The doubt makes you a little uncomfortable, though, doesn't it? I'll return shortly with Act Two. man's distinctive characteristics, one of the traits that sets him apart from the beast, is his desire for privacy. He is a gregarious creature, true, but his business is his own. He resents having it pried into and will fight if he must to put a stop to the prying. It appears that Professor Dwight Addison's privacy is being invaded. He is not an ordinary man, and should not be expected to take ordinary countermeasures. But that he will take action of some sort is quite certain. Dwight? Uh, yes, Jane? Oh, I'm sorry to bother you in the lab. You, you know I never do, but... Oh, it's I... all right, it's all right, my dear. It's quite all right. Well, I was going to bed, but I... I didn't think I could sleep. Are you angry with me, Dwight? Why, no, of course I'm not. Why should I be angry? Uh, about going into the city. You acted so, well, not a bit like yourself. Oh. Well, you see, I, I got this idea for a new type of hearing aid, and I just wanted hearing to... Hearing aid? Well, you're not having trouble with your hearing, are you? No, no, it's not for me. I just had an idea, I don't know where it came from, really, about a way to improve the quality of the sound reproduced in those small hearing aids they use nowadays, and... Well, you know how I am. <laughs> yes, I know how you are. I, I, I wanted to do it before I got back on to the other thing. Will you be long here? Another hour or so, I expect. Well, you get some sleep, dear. You'll need your rest for the trip into the city tomorrow. Do we really have to go, Dwight? I'm afraid so. There are a few things I must do, and I will need your help. Mr. Smith, I've been here almost an hour. I was detained. Your wife didn't come with you? I thought it would be better for one of us to stay at the house. Commendable. Thank you. You were going to tell me something about what this Professor Addison is up to? Yes. We have reason to believe that he's working on a method, uh, a mathematical concept, I should say, which may very well achieve the time bypass necessary for interstellar travel. I, um... I didn't quite get that. It's completely beyond either of us. Don't expect me to explain it to you. He's working on a way to travel between stars, between galaxies. You take it seriously? You believe it's possible? It's already been done, my friend. Where do you think the unidentified flying objects come from? Well, I've always thought they were optical illusions or something like that. A great many people do. It's a belief my clients have always encouraged. You and I know better. Hmm. I guess so. And do you think Professor Addison can do it? I don't know anything about it myself. My clients seem to believe that he's very close. It's our job to help them find out how close. And then what? They want him stopped. That's all I know. Now, look, if they plan to uh, get rid of him somehow, I don't want any part of it at any price. And I still don't know what to look for if I get into his lab. Not if. When? Look for anything that he's jotted down. Every word, every number, everything. Here, I brought you this. Um, a cigarette lighter? It's made to look like one. Actually, it's a camera, and a very good one. Oh, no kidding. But, but I'll show the, you how uh, it works later. Does the professor have a good desk lamp? Well, it's three-way. I think it goes up to 150 watts. Pretty bright. Well, that's all you need. I want every scrap of paper you find in that lab photographed. It doesn't have to look important. You're not the one who decides. I don't have keys to his desk, you know. I'm not concerned with how you get at his papers. Just do it. Oh, okay, I'll think of something. Are the bugs working all right? You'd have heard about it if they weren't. 
You don't work very hard at making friends, do you, Mr. Smith? I don't make friends. I buy accomplices. Ah, my, my favorite breakfast. How did you know, Edgar? Mrs. Addison told Pearl that you like poached eggs. Mmm, they look good, don't they? They are beautiful. Uh, uh, Professor Addison. Yes, Edgar? Uh, Mrs. Addison told Pearl you were working in the lab pretty much all night. Uh, uh, would you like me to go in and kind of uh, straighten up for you? Oh, no, 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 thank you. I wouldn't mind at all. I wouldn't mess with anything, of course. Just sort of put the place in order. Edgar, I don't like anybody in my lab, not anybody at all. Mm. Are you still planning to go into the city, Dwight? You hardly got any sleep at all. Oh, yes, we, we really must. Will there be anything else right now, Professor? No, thank you, Edgar. Uh, I'll be sure to tell Pearl what you said about not going into the lab. We'd better get started, hadn't we? Started? Oh, oh for the city. Well, there's no hurry, really. I'd like to test my hearing aid before we go. Test it? I'm curious about how it reacts to various acoustical situations. I want to put it in my ear and try out the sound in various rooms of the house and then outside. Oh, why don't you come along? A little walk around the grounds. Sounds terribly baronial, doesn't it? <laughs> Funny. I never knew you were interested in hearing it. Well, the idea just hit me suddenly. <laughs> They're out back now, Edgar. What are they doing? Well, she's uh, cutting some flowers, and well, he keeps wandering around listening to something. Yeah, birds, I guess. He's trying out a hearing aid. Uh, look, do you want to help me here? Okay. It's one of the keys on this ring. I never saw a house with so many keys and locks. I think this is it. Is that what he's working on? A hearing aid? No, he got sidetracked, I guess. No. What are you going to do in the lab? I have to take pictures of any papers I can find. Now leave the door open so we can hear them if they come in. Take pictures? Just help me look for papers, will you? Any kind. Anything with something written on it. Well, he, he must have emptied the waste paper basket himself. Mm. Oh, well, the desk is locked. I knew it would be. This filing cabinet's locked, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, here's some stuff. Under the desk blotter. Oh, good. Let me see. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Gibberish. I guess that's a good sign. A good sign? Now, listen, Pearl. Go out and watch them through the window, will you? I've got to get pictures of this stuff. Now, just let me know if they start back toward the house. Well, why is it a good sign if there's just, well, you know, whatever you said, gibberish on the papers? Just watch, will you? <laughs> I won't know what half these flowers are until they bloom. This one's an iris. I know that much. Uh, you'll have to speak up, Jane. I can't hear a thing you're saying. That's some hearing aid you made. It doesn't seem to be working very well. I might as well not be wearing it at all. Well, do you know what's wrong with it? Just need some adjustment, I imagine. Dwight, do you really have a lot of secret stuff in the lab? Oh, yes, indeed. Practically everything in there. Top secret. Things... Edgar and Pearl shouldn't see? Well, that's why I told them to stay out of the lab, Jane. I have papers in there that no one should see. Did you lock the door? To the lab? Well, of course. Aren't you afraid that telling them not to go into the lab will only make them all the more curious? Just serve as an added temptation? Oh, I don't think so. Surely we can trust Pearl and Edgar. <laughs> Get out of there, Edgar. They're coming back toward the house. Okay, okay, I've finished anyway. Just turn the light off and put these papers back under the blotter. Hurry up, will you? I'm all finished. All right, you better come away from that window. It's all right. It's supposed to be my kitchen. I'm just uh, stacking the breakfast dishes. Oh, Pearl, can you get me a vase to put these flowers in? Oh, sure, Mrs. Addison. My, they're pretty, aren't they? What are those little blue ones? Oh, grape hyacinths. I think you'd know as long as you've been working here. Oh, uh, well, uh, Edgar does all the gardening. Edgar and Mrs. Uh, 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 Ellis. <laughs> Mrs. Ellis. Uh, go find a vase for Mrs. Addison Pearl. Uh, Mrs. Ellis, yes. I'm so bad with names. Sometimes I almost can't remember my own. Go get the vase, Pearl. I'll get that nice blue one Mrs. Ellis likes so much. <laughs> Sure, 
over on the right road, Dwight? Well, I'm taking a slightly different route this time. I'd like us to enjoy the natural beauty of these mountains and somehow four lanes with a minimum speed of 40 miles an hour doesn't give you much of a chance. You know, it's funny about Pearl. What's funny about her? Well, she's been living in that house for a long time. Years, the way they tell it. And she doesn't know a grape hyacinth when she sees one. They're, they're perennials, you know. They come up every spring, year after year. Well, she probably just doesn't have that much interest in flowers. Some people don't. Mm, maybe. And she couldn't remember Mrs. Ellis's name. Been working for her for years and couldn't remember her name. You're just too suspicious, Jane. Edgar and Pearl are fine people. We're lucky to have them. Either the professor got lost or Mr. Smith Almighty's unhappy about something again. Mm. Hello. In future, we'd prefer that Professor and Mrs. Addison not leave the house. Well, now, just how do you expect me to stop them? It may be necessary to tamper with their car. That is why I called, however. And why did you? Impertinence doesn't become you. I called to suggest that you advise your wife not to be an idiot if she can possibly avoid it. I don't know what you mean. The thing about the flowers. Well, Pearl didn't know what the flowers were. She wasn't thinking. Yes, that was obvious. Also, is it too much to ask that she remember the name of the woman she's been working for all these years? Well, she covered that up fine. They didn't suspect a thing. Mrs. Addison did. We've been monitoring them in the car. A good agent memorizes every detail of his cover. That's the first rule. <sighs> Look, if you wanted spies, you should have hired spies. Yes. That has occurred to me, too. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to punch that guy in the nose. Well, maybe you're not lost, but I am. It's a beautiful spring day, dear. A day meant for wandering. Look. Just, just look at that. <laughs> now what? Well, there's a path leading off into the woods. Don't you see it there? It would be sinful, downright sinful not to follow it. You mean get out and take that path into the woods? Well, we have to know where it leads, Jane. Don't you feel you just have to? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't feel the least bit that way. I bet there'd be snakes in there. Jane, please come with me. Why? Because I ask you to. Well, if you put it that way. Here, let me help you. Those aren't very good shoes for walking in the woods. Well, I thought I was going to the city. Takes me back to my childhood. Uh, watch those branches, dear. Let, let me hold them for you. Oh, it's, it's muddy. No, no, no. That's, that's leaf mold. Oh. It's quite a different thing. All right. I guess this is far enough. Far enough for what? Now, listen carefully, Jane. We can't stay out of the car too long. Well, why not if we want to? That house is bugged. The lawn is bugged. Even our car is bugged. Bugged? Eavesdropping devices. Every word we've said since we moved into that house has been overheard. Beware of the man with the high IQ and the irresponsible behavior. He is not what he seems. He doesn't accept values blindly, but has a close look at each one as it is offered to him and decides for himself how much it is worth. Professor Addison is not an easy mark, clearly, and the battle has just been joined. We'll hear the outcome when I return shortly with Act Three. The creatures of an alien culture, beings from a galaxy light years removed from our Earth, have become interested in the researches of Professor Dwight Addison. They have caused to be planted in the house, which he has rented for the summer, a network of listening devices, which keeps him and his wife Jane under constant surveillance. These two, Professor and Mrs. Addison, have eluded the eavesdroppers temporarily by leaving their car, in which a bug has been planted, and walking down a wooded path. 
But how can you be sure that everything is bugged the way you say? How can you be so sure? That little gadget I've been calling a hearing aid isn't a hearing aid at all, Jane. It's a device for detecting radio transmission. Radio transmission? The bugs they've planted in and around the house are tiny radio transmitters. I get a beep from the thing I had in my ear every time I get near one. They're all over the house, two or three in several of the rooms. And they've been placed around the grounds in such a way that there's not a spot anywhere where we could talk without being overheard. In the car, too? At least one in the car. Pearl and Edgar. Oh, yes, Pearl and Edgar. They're very unlikely servants, haven't you noticed that? Would they be working for somebody else, or or are they... Oh, somebody else... Oh, they're only agents. As a matter of fact, I suspect strongly that they're in the employ of intelligent beings from another world. Oh, now, really, Dwight. The project I have in hand would interest such beings. It's not much of a secret anymore that this planet has been visited. Flying saucer? Well, there have been some very, very secret investigations. There's not much doubt about it among the people who have the facts. And your work is... They be interested. We shouldn't have left Pearl and Edgar alone in the house. What if they get into the lab? Oh, I'm sure they have a duplicate key. But there's nothing in there of any consequence. Well, you told me the place was full of secret material. Well, that was for the benefit of the eavesdroppers, whoever they are. No, no, no. I have it all in my head, Jane. I don't trust papers. Oh, I hate being spied on. I've I've given them something to think about, though. I left some papers under my desk pad for them, phony as $3 bills. Phony? Utter nonsense. Jane, I have a plan. I'll need your help. You don't have to ask. Thank you, my dear. I'm going to turn you into a nagging wife. And when we get back to the car, I want you to start complaining. Over Y to the fourth power equals... And then he's got a question mark that he's gone over and over until the paper's almost cut through by the pen. You found nothing except the papers under his desk pad? Just these four sheets, yes. Is that all of it? Well, then he's got some scribbled notes at the bottom. He's written down the word heterodyne two or three times like he was thinking on paper, you know. And then third voltage. On another line, he's written light, speed, plus, then crossed out the plus and printed it in again in capital letters. Light, speed, plus. That's interesting. Any more? Well, just some figures at the bottom. Now, wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Now, we've been out of touch with the Addisons for almost half an hour. They've returned to their car now. But this must not happen again. Well, what do you want me to do? There's something you do to a car's carburetor to put it out of commission. Do you know about that? Yes, yes, that's easy enough. Well, then do it as soon as they bring the car back. And try to do it right. Well, I hope you're satisfied. It was beautiful. Well, wasn't it beautiful? Back there in that jungle? It was crawly. But, Jane, I I, I just felt like going into the woods. So we went. Dwight, what did you want to do in the city? Just some errands. That's what I asked you. What errands? Things to do with the project I'm working on. I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to go into it. Not at liberty. You have to make a left turn at the next crossroad. I know that. My work is very secret. I've told you that before. I'm not free to talk about it to anybody. Anybody at all. Well, it makes a woman feel unwanted. Oh, now, come on, Jane. You know better than that. One of these days, and maybe before too long, I'll just decide not to stay where I'm not wanted. Jane! If you can be trusted with a secret, why can't I? It's just that you don't want to tell me. Well, one of these days, maybe you'll be sorry after I've left you. Jane, you don't mean that. You'll find out. Or... Well, all right. I'll tell you. So tell me. Well, not now. I can't go into it while I'm driving. It's too distracting. I'll tell you when we get home. You missed the turn, you know. Don't tap 
go in the car. You understand me? Don't touch it unless you hear from me. Well, okay, but you said we the car... We have to believe that we're going to get some vital information as soon as the Addisons get home. They should be there very soon. Well, okay, then then you don't, don't want me to... I don't want you to do anything until you're told to do something. Now stay near your telephone for further instructions. We get 20,000. He gets a punch in the nose. <laughs> This is wrong. All wrong, Jane. I want your absolute promise that you will never... Dwight, ne if you're going to start that again... Oh, all right, all right. What I'm working on is a new kind of radio signal. A radio signal? Well, good heavens, what's so hush-hush about a radio but signal? this is quite different from the kind of radio signal you're thinking of. This is a sound that kills whoever hears it. Kill. Slowly and rather painfully, I'm afraid. Mm. I haven't been able to work out a way to make it more humane. You, you mean you just turn your radio on and you get this sound or whatever it is and it kills you? Yes. Its effect is not unlike the effect of nerve gas. Yes, yes, it's, it's quite deadly, quite awful, really. But I don't see how that's possible. Just a, a noise that comes out of your radio. Well, there's a whole new mathematical concept involved. It, it works, though. It works. I, I don't think you ought to do it. Is it... Are you close? Oh, the device itself is finished, ready to use. There's the problem, of course, of testing it without... Well, without killing anybody. I think it's absolutely dreadful. Well, yes, it is, rather. I worked out one of the problems last night, a shield to protect the sender. Your hearing aid. Well, it wasn't a hearing aid at all, of course. Used in the sender's ears, both ears, of course, it neutralizes the effect of the signal. Oh, it's, it, it, it's worse than the atom bomb. In some ways, I suppose it is. There's no antidote. Once you've heard the signal, you're dead. There's no way to arrest it. As you say, it is rather dreadful. Uh, what, do you, what do you intend to do with it? Well, the first thing I must do is to make another of the shields tonight and make sure that they work. Make sure? How? I'll feed the sound through an amplifier, not broadcast it, of course, and wear the two shields. If I'm not affected, then I know the shield works. But, Dwight, you can't. I can't think of another way. You'd better stay clear of the lab tonight. I'll, I'll have to warn Pearl and Edgar. Does it... Does it work on just any old radio? Any radio. Through any transmitter. Anything from your big commercial transmitter to one of those tiny little things they use as eavesdropping devices. Uh, bugs, I think they're called. I, I, I wish you wouldn't do that tonight, Dwight. No, I'll be all right, my dear. The shields will work. And there aren't any radio transmitters nearby. After all, we're not bugged. I want all listening devices removed from the house and grounds. The car, too. Every bug you planted, I want out at once. Destroy them as you remove them. Make sure not one of them is left functional. Would you care to come with me for a walk around the grounds, Jane? All right, if you'd like to. It's a lovely afternoon. Edgar and Pearl have been out enjoying it. Oh, Edgar. Uh, yes, Professor? Before I forget it, I think it would be a good idea if you and Pearl stayed in your quarters this evening. I'm doing a rather special experiment, and I, I think it would be safer for you. Okay, uh, the whole evening? Until quite late, yes. It's a... It's a lovely day, isn't it? Mrs. Addison and I are going to take a little walk. Yes, yes, it's very nice out, and, uh... Oh, it's okay about tonight. We can talk now, Jane. You mean we're free of those things? Out here. They've removed all the bugs from the grounds. I've been watching them. Removed and dismantled them as they went. Afraid of your experiment tonight? Whoever's been listening must have given the orders. Oh, what a gorgeous day. Let's plan to stay out for at least an hour. That ought to give them time to clear the house of bugs. What are you doing, Edgar? I want to tell Smith all the bugs are out. I think maybe I ought to tell him what the professor said about a special experiment tonight, too. I expect he'd uh, want to know that. I wonder why he wanted the bugs out. You think he'd tell me? 
Mm-hmm. Oh, come on, come on. Why doesn't he answer? The number you have reached is not in service at this time. The number you have reached is not in service at this time. This is a recording. Mr. Smith's run out on us. What do you mean? The phone's been disconnected. Oh, so that's, then how are we going to collect our money? We're not. This phone number is our only contact with them. A man named Smith, even if it was his real name, and you know damn well it's not. Oh, but, but uh, our $20,000. If I ever find him, I won't just punch him in the nose. I'll kill him. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to get out of this house right now. If they're scared, so am I. <laughs> Come to the window, Jane. Well, what's happening out there now? They're leaving. I watched them loading their car with luggage. We've seen the last of Pearl and Edgar. <sighs> Maybe we should go, too. Why? We've paid our rent for the season. The bugs are gone. We'll have to run a big house without help for a while, of course, but... Uh... Oh, well, that's all right with me. Incidentally, how did you like my performance as the nagging wife? Uh, much too well, my dear. <laughs> I'll never cast you in a role like that again. Quite. Yes, dear? You're not really working on that awful thing, are you? I mean, the radio signal that kills people? No. <laughs> no, nothing of the kind. Actually, what I'm working on is a time bypass that will make traveling between galaxies possible. Really make it possible? If it works. It looks good in theory. Of course, I know how to make the lethal radio signal. You do? Oh, yes. Yes, there's nothing to it, really, once you understand the mathematics. Oh, Dwight, you wouldn't. Oh, no, no, dear. That's one secret nobody's ever going to get out of me. Not even a nagging wife. Professor Addison has tricked the eavesdroppers into removing their listening devices from his home and his laboratory. But has he stopped them altogether? They seem to be a determined breed. And I'm sorry to say, there are always people around like Mr. Smith and Pearl and Edgar Parker who will sell out if the price is right. Perhaps we've heard the last of the eavesdroppers. And perhaps we haven't. I'll be back shortly. At this reading, interstellar travel has not been announced as feasible. But things move fast in this age. Don't be too surprised if you hear on a newscast that Professor Dwight Addison has found a way to make it feasible. And be with us, no matter what method of travel it requires, for our next look at some of the improbabilities that turn out to be, after all, possible. Our cast included Arnold Moss, Patricia Wheel, William Redford, Ralph Bell, and Joan Arliss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. How is Joan? Oh, the beast tore her arm, but it's not serious. We'll strike camp and get away today. I think, Reverend, for the safety of all concerned, it would be better not to leave the island just now. Both Mrs. Manning and I are grateful for your presence, Dr. Carter. But I can't help thinking that perhaps all of our problems would have been solved if you hadn't stopped me when I had the brute in my gun sights. Had you fired, and had you killed the thing, you would have committed murder. Murder? Well, now you've got me completely confounded. How can killing this... this thing possibly be murder? Well, this thing, as you refer to it, Reverend, is a man. One of this camping party. A man gone savage. Well, I saw the thing. That was no man. That was a dog or a wolf. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed it. 
this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you've enjoyed this and want to hear more,